This is PediaCast. Welcome to PediaCast, a pediatric podcast for parents. And now, direct from the campus of Nationwide Children's, here is your host, Dr. Mike. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to PediaCast. It is a pediatric podcast for moms and dads. This is Dr. Mike coming to you from the campus of Nationwide Children's Hospital. We're in Columbus, Ohio. It's episode 518 for May 12th, 2022. We're calling this one Your Child's Skin Part 1. I want to welcome all of you to the program. We have another episode with our illustrious Pediatrics in Plain Language panel, which means that Dr. Alex Rakowski and Dr. Marianne Abrams will be joining us shortly. And it's sort of an exciting day because for the first time since the beginning of the pandemic, we will be recording in the Pediacast studio, the, the three of us that make up the Pediatrics in Plain Language panel. Uh, we're going to do it together in person. Uh, and this is exciting because I haven't seen Alex and Marianne uh, face-to-face in person in the same room in over two years, which is crazy to me. And we're all vaccinated. We're all healthy. So I'm thinking that hugs might be in order when, when I see them. But we'll see. Uh, and I'll try to remember to report back on that. C- because, you know, it's a thing, right? It's been so long that you want to give your friends a hug, especially the ones you haven't seen in person in a very long time. Um, I mean, okay, fine. That was the social norm before the pandemic when you hadn't seen someone that you, you know, that you're friends with and you like, and it's been a while, you give them a hug. Uh, But now after a couple years of masks and isolation and Zoom meetings, you know, hugging seems a little weird, unsafe, maybe even risky. I don't know. Has anyone else felt that way or is it just me? Maybe it's just me. I don't know. But uh, I do feel like quick hugs are in order for the plain language panel because it's been a rough couple years for all of us and we're good friends and it really will be wonderful uh, seeing them walk into the studio live and in person uh, once again. All right, we should move on. I, I did not mean to go off the rails with a conversation on hugging my guests. If, if you're an upcoming first time PediaCast guest, don't worry, there's no pressure. Hugs are not expected until you've been on the show a few times. All right. Or, you know, if you don't want to hug, we don't have to hug. It's fine. Okay, now it's getting a little weird. Uh, All right, what are we talking about today? (laughs) We have been covering uh, body systems and common illnesses and injuries that impact those systems uh, in our plain language episode, uh, our plain language panel episodes. Uh, We've covered eyes, ears, nose, mouth, throat, lungs, also the stomach and intestines, which we covered over the course of two episodes. And we have another two-parter for you now with a part one coming today and part two arriving later in the summer as we consider your child's skin. Now, the skin is the largest organ in the body, and there is a lot that can go wrong with it. So today we'll be covering uh, some of those conditions and then others we'll explore during part two. By the way, all of these plain language episodes can be found bundled together in one playlist on SoundCloud, and I'll put a link to the playlist in the show notes for this episode, uh, 518 over at uh, pediacast.org. For those of you who are new to the show, our plain language episodes cover basic topics that all parents really ought to know, and uh, we're intentional about using everyday language as we cover the topics. Now, that does not mean that we hold back important details. You know, we want you to be informed and understand, but we try to avoid medical jargon when we can. And if that jargon is unavoidable, we make an effort to explain exactly uh, what that medical jargon means. Uh, of course, this is the model really for every episode of PediaCast. But in the case of the plain language panel, uh, we hold ourselves accountable to that plan and sometimes call each other out, which uh, can be interesting at times or perhaps annoying based on your individual expectations as an audience member. Uh, We try not to go overboard. Let me put it that way. All right. Before we get to Alex and Marianne, let's cover our usual quick reminders. I do want to remind you, PediaCast is available wherever podcasts are found. Uh, That includes the Apple and Google podcast apps, iHeartRadio, Spotify, SoundCloud, Amazon Music, and most other podcast apps for iOS and Android. And that includes Good Pods now. If you are a Good Pods user, uh, we are available in that app uh, these days. If you like what you hear, please remember to subscribe or like our show or follow or which whatever terminology you're 
your podcast app uses. Uh, that way you won't miss an episode. And also please consider leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts so that others who come along looking for evidence-based child health and parenting information will know what to expect. We're also on social media. We love connecting with you there. You'll find us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Simply search for PediaCast. And then there's that handy contact page over at PediaCast.org if you would like to suggest a future topic for the program. Also, I want to remind you the information presented in every episode of PediaCast is for general educational purposes only. We do not diagnose medical conditions or formulate treatment plans for specific individuals. If you have a concern about your child's health, be sure to call your healthcare provider. Also, your use of this audio program is subject to the PediaCast Terms of Use Agreement, which you can find at PediaCast.org. So let's take a quick break. We'll get Dr. Alex Rakowski and Dr. Mary Ann Abrams settled into the studio, and then we will be back to talk about your child's skin. It's coming up right after this. Our Pediatrics and Plain Language panel is in the house once again. You'll recall that Dr. Marianne Abrams is an assistant professor of pediatrics at The Ohio State University College of Medicine and a pediatrician with primary care pediatrics at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Dr. Alex Rakowski, also an assistant professor of pediatrics at Ohio State and a pediatrician with Olentangy Primary Care at Nationwide Children's. Let's give a warm welcome back to our friends. And this time we are all in person together in the studio, which is really exciting. It's been like two years. And so it's great to see uh, your smiling faces. And of course, as always, thank you both for stopping by. Thank you so much. It's been, it's been two years. Yeah, it's like the anniversary. Yeah, it's great yeah. to be back. Yep. And in the intro, I mentioned I might give you guys a hug, and we did hug. So yeah. <laughs> I said I would report back. I'm like, we're all vaccinated. We're all healthy. We haven't seen each other in two years. We're friends. You know, hugs just seem to be in yeah. order. So, yeah. all right. Well, we always begin with a Marianne uh, giving us a little uh, bit of information on plain language, since uh, this is our plain language panel. Uh, so, Marianne, why is well, what is plain language, and why is that important? I thought I'd just keep it simple and basic this time um, and tell what I usually tell other, you know, like if I'm giving a talk, like what do I say plain language is? And it's simple. Um, it uses just the number and type of words that you need to get your point across. It allows people to focus on the message and not try to navigate and figure out all the other words and the flowery language or the technical words. Um, and it lets us communicate effectively when we need to make sure that our message is heard. Yeah. And then I was trying to think of words that there's some technical words that when we talk about skin, which I think we're going to be talking about today, um, that we may not use routinely when we're in seeing patients and families. Uh, but there are others that kind of trip out of our, our mouth just um, automatically. So uh, epidermis is sort of the technical word for the skin and that part of the body, but we probably wouldn't use that term a whole lot, but we might use the word cutaneous. We might use the word topical. And I think those are words um, that basically mean on the skin or that we use on the skin or the skin. So I was just trying to kind of think ahead about what some of those words might be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know for me, uh, exanthem. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, you would talk about a viral exanthem and people are like, exanthem, what in the world is that? And it's just a fancy word for rash, right? And we always talk about papules and pustules and yeah. um Erythema. We yeah. could have like a whole game right now. Just yeah. Name another word. Yeah. Yeah. And we would, we could, we say those words sometimes. And rarethema means redness. And papule kind of means like, looks kind of like a pimple. So anyway. Yeah. Yeah. No. Right. So we want to use, um, I mean, it's okay to still explain complex concepts, but we want to use words that uh, everybody's going to understand. And that's the the heart of plain language. Um, we are loosely following a book called What to Do When Your Child Gets Sick, which is from the Institute for Healthcare Advancement. And we do have a discount code on the website. If you go to pediacast.org and look for this episode 518, uh, pod 719 will get 
to a cheaper price. Of course, it's also available wherever books are found. And then um, these plain language episodes that we have, um, uh, we'd like to get your feedback on how how they're going, what you think about them, if there's any topics that you would like us to talk about in the future, that sort of thing. And so we do have a pediatrics and plain language survey for you, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. And then I also want to remind you, we have um, all of our uh, pediatrics and plain language episodes uh, packaged together on SoundCloud as a playlist. And I'll put a link to that too. You can find all of the past episodes that we've done because there have been uh, quite a few of them. Uh, Today, we're going to cover your child's skin. And uh, it's so much information, so many different things that can uh, be a problem with the skin uh, that we've broken it into two episodes. So this is going to be part one. And then later in the summer, I think it's in August or so, uh, we're going to be doing part two. So stay tuned for that. Uh, So this week, though, we're going to we're going to just kind of go down a laundry list of things that that occur with the skin. The first one is diaper rash. And so, Alex, uh, tell us, uh, you know, what is your spiel when you uh, see a kid with diaper rash in the exam room? What do you tell the parents about that? I mean, first off, I want to say that we don't have 10 or 12 of these plain language. So we need a world tour soon and like a T-shirt that says that. (laughs) So I think, the, yeah, I think so too. That's the next step. The pandemic's yeah. over. Let's go travel. Yeah, let's go travel. So, <laughs> so the way to explain diaper rash. So in, in the dead of winter, we all get chapped lips or chapped hands because it gets our skin gets exposed to a harsh environment. And if you think about a baby's skin, it's going to be thinner than adult skin. So in general, that skin is going to be a little more sensitive than thicker adult skin. And then you put a diaper on top of it. So now it's going to be moist and it's also going to be hotter down there. So you're already setting up a child for irritation. And then they pee a lot, and then they poop a fair amount. And a lot of the poop that they have will have high acidity, which is going to even like do more damage to that skin. So now I have a child whose diaper is wet, hot, exposed to fluids, exposed to some acidity from the stools, which is natural, and you get an irritation. So diaper rash really is an irritation of the skin around it. So when you have the poop, or the, or the urine, it kind of burns a little bit of the skin off. It's not really a burn. It's more like a chapping kind of phenomenon. And there are some, most diaper rash is just going to be more of an irritation diaper rash or an irritant diaper rash. But you can also have a fungus set up shop and funguses grow in hot, moist areas like your shower. And so when parents like freak out a lot of times, they're also like, why does my child have a fungus down there? It's just because there, it's in the air and they'll set up in a hot, moist area. And so the diaper is a hot, moist area. So if it's a fungal rash, then we'll look at it. It has like a specific appearance to it. They have these little, like what we call satellite lesions or little like pinpoint lesions around the rash. And we'll treat that with an antifungal. Or it can actually be a bacterial infection. We can be like really raw looking. And sometimes that needs an antibiotic. Um, and sometimes you have a combination. So first step for diaper rashes is to essentially just keep the diaper covered, the diaper area covered at all times after every poop or pee, gently wash, cover like a thick like cream. Um, we tend to use zinc oxide based things like desitin or vitamin A and D, but there are a lot of really good ones out there. And then if it doesn't get better, and would literally do it every time you change a, a child. If it's not getting better or if you see, so the key is just to prevent the rash from occurring. But once you get the rash, you know, try to like overly aggressively kind of cover it. If that doesn't work, then get seen by one of us just to make sure it's not a fungal or a bacterial infection. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a really great uh, overall view of diaper rashes. I mean, most of these parents are going to be able to treat at home, but like you said, uh, if it's not getting better, um, you know, it could be yeast, it could be bacteria, and so you you may need more treatment than just what yeah. you can do at home. So just to, when you say cover, you mean like protect it with a like an ointment, a thick ointment, because sometimes you can if if babies you can kind of leave their bottom open to air to kind of keep that moisture from building up if there's a little time for that. Yeah, and there's actually... Go ahead. Yeah, and that's a great question. I I think that there will be situations where you just cannot get rid of a sensitive child's, you know, a child with more sensitive skin's diaper rash just because they get exposed to things all the time. And we just had a child in clinic a couple days ago that had this situation and fortunately, by a certain age, let's say by four or six months, they, they have a, almost like a scheduled pooping schedule. So, you know, Joey will poop at like first feed, afternoon feed number two, and then right before sleep. Yeah. So a if, lot of parents have the same thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So hopefully it's not three times a day. So, yeah, um, even though I poop, I have afternoon feed number two. Yeah. Um, so, but it's, um, but in this situation, you can then kind of predict, okay, I'm not have to, I won't have to worry about a stool incident 
So I, I, you can put the child on like a, on a rug or, or like I say a towel or we, we have some called shocks, which are these little like blue things that absorb urine. Have the child lie there um, or play there with an exposed area. And that kind of dries it out. It also gets some more, um, some of the moisture off and gets some of the heat off. Um, so again, if you have a predictable situation, then I think it's, it's a great idea to kind of air it out. Um, but I think in infants, it's really hard because they can so, stool yeah. eight, 10 times a day. You know, and then it gets really frustrating for the parents. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the barrier cream is so important. So you mentioned the zinc oxide or the A&D ointment. And you're not only using that to soothe the skin, you're really creating a physical barrier too, right? You yeah. know, so that the pee and the poop and the diaper doesn't touch the skin. It's touching the cream instead. And I think that's the most important thing is you're really setting up a barrier. And just to kind of make sure that it doesn't doesn't kind of give the damage. And some kids are going to be more sensitive to certain diapers. It's not so much a diaper um, allergy. Um, some diapers just just do a better job of getting the urine out of there. Um, so you may need to change diaper brands and sometimes to go for more expensive, which I think is is difficult for a lot of families. So we have families that cannot afford, let's say, a higher like more expensive brand. So just be more aggressive just to kind of make sure that you're covering up to, to kind of avoid that. Yeah, yeah. And that's one other point, I think. Sometimes people are trying so hard to keep their babies clean and safe that they may over clean their bottoms, like with extra wipes and rub harder. And even the wipes can be a little irritating if you use them too often or too hard and rub too much. There could be such a thing as too much. So gentleness, and if they do have a dirty diaper, gently cleaning that away, not scrubbing so hard, because that can do some superficial damage to the skin, and that can let some of this other um, yeah, stuff Yeah, and, and I, I like the water-based wipes. So mm-hmm. a lot of the wipes when we had our kids were alcohol-based, and it just irritates more. Um, so there's a, a big push now for more of the water-based. So if you can get a water-based wipe, or even the ones that have some aloe, again, if it's affordable, um, this seems to help out a little bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, as we move from the baby's bottom uh, to their face and trunk, uh, we start to see, you know, there's always that saying like, oh, you have skin as soft as a baby's skin. But baby skin oftentimes is not so soft or pretty, right? Uh, so one of the things that they can get is a, a heat rash or a miliaria rubra is another name for it. Uh, that's the, that's the big name that, uh, that's, the plain language that's, name. that's the, that's the ICD-10 <laughs> code and <laughs> which is also not plain language. Sorry. Um, that's just how we code things that for, for the diagnosis, um, in the chart. So anyway, uh, heat rash, Marianne, tell us about that. Yeah, there's it. I guess the main thing is it's not a, a bad thing or a scary thing, but it may alarm parents. Sometimes it's called prickly heat and heat, heat rash is probably a good name for it. Cause in general, it's sort of a, a reddish rash sometimes with little dots on it, um, uh, that is usually a result, we don't know exactly what causes it, but we know it's more common when people of all ages, but especially babies, are, are kind of wrapped up and extra warm and maybe um, swaddling can be good, but too much swaddling. And it just brings out this little red rash often on their faces, but it can be on their trunk. Um, and again, older people can get it too. So there's it doesn't bother um babies much. It probably bothers grandparents and visitors and parents even more than the baby. And just take a look and see if you can lighten up what their their clothing is, their blankets, their covering, uh, and use things like like cotton that may be more breathable. And it usually will fade away on its own within a few months. Yeah. So it's not really anything you have to treat. It's not hazardous or dangerous, but you may, you know, if it's hanging around and uh, you're not quite sure what it is, by all means, see your doctor and let them take a look at it. And they may say, oh, you know, it's nothing to worry about. Um, But there are other things that can cause red bumps too, that, you know, that we may want to differentiate which is happening. Uh, one of those other types of red bumps are uh, uh, baby acne, and uh, that one, uh, erythema toxicum neonatorum. See, I don't think anyone would say that accidentally in the room. Uh, so what is – babies get acne, Alex? Yeah, and people freak out when you actually put that code in, and it ends up in the after-visit summary. So it's not really acne. So if, if you step back, a baby inside mom's going to be living in a water environment, so that skin is going to be a little thicker and more waterproof. And they also have a lot of fuzz on them. So a lot of kids will be born fuzzier and have like a different skin. And in the first few weeks, that fuzz is going to come off and that skin is going to change to normal outside of a womb skin. 
And and just a quick story. I had a young baby yesterday and a three-year-old brother, and we unwrapped a baby and looked at the back, and the kid had really lots of fuzz on the back, and the three-year-old was like, he looks just like grandpa. So I was like, (laughs) yes. To which mom got quite red. She she had malaria rubra of her face. Um, So, But baby acne is essentially the change of that skin and the hair follicles basically coming off. Nobody's really sure why this occurs. It doesn't act like acne, even though it's called baby acne. So acne medicines don't seem to help. Um, but it's essentially a process where it, you have a changing of the skin, changing of the hair follicles. They actually think it's a hair follicle irritation that causes it. Um, there's no really need to treat it. Some parents want to do something. So if you want to put some you know, cocoa butter on it or a moisturizer or grape, it doesn't seem to kind of make it any better or any worse. Um, it always happens the day of a baby picture. So it makes, and that's the sort of like a, a Murphy's Law. And then you just have to keep an eye on it. If it's really bad, if the child's not acting right, the one thing that can look like this is a herpes infection. Um, so you do have to, if, if it doesn't look the way it should, or if it's changing or the child's not acting normally, have one of us look at it just to make sure we're not looking at a Especially herpes Especially if they're infection. real fussy, you know, yeah. like it hurts. Because yeah. yeah. normally baby acne doesn't hurt that yeah. much. And, and the books say two to four weeks, but that's really based on a larger study from Europe of more fair-skinned and more fair-haired um, individuals. Um, but I work in a clinic that's about 35% immigrant. A lot of it's Middle East and West African. And we'll see um, baby act until up to two to three months sometimes, until all that skin comes off, and especially some of the hair comes off. So it's actually a lot more extensive time-wise than people realize. Yeah. But this is another one that generally you don't have to worry about. You don't do much for it. It's just yeah. there and and uh, it will go away. You just need some tincture of time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, let's move on. Uh, still talking about baby skin. And another one that folks hear about is cradle cap uh, or seborrheic dermatitis is the medical term for it. Uh, Marianne, tell us about cradle cap. Well, cradle cap falls in the same category of um It's not a bad, terrible disease. Um, It can look rather impressive and worrisome and maybe annoying, um, but it doesn't really hurt and it will go away on its own. So so what is it? Uh, It's common in infants. Um, It can last up to about a year of age, but usually it's going to go away on its own within two or three months or sooner. Um, Usually the baby feels fine, but what it looks like is the sort of waxy, um, almost like little scales, mainly on the baby's head and, and their scalp. It can also be on places on their face, like their eye, eye, eyebrows, and a few other places occasionally, but it's primarily on that, that head and scalp piece. And people are worried and concerned, and does it bother my baby? That's always concerning. Uh, but in general, again, we aren't quite sure what causes it, um, but if it's kind of annoying, uh, there are some things that you can do to kind of improve how it looks uh, by using some like a mineral oil or baby oil or petroleum to kind of massage that into the the scales and the scalp and the little bit of hair on their head. Um, and then gently you get a little baby brush or a soft toothbrush and try to, that, that oil will loosen those scales and try to brush it out to remove that. Um, and you can also do that by maybe using a little mild baby shampoo a couple times a week, again, trying to kind of work those scales a little bit loose, but don't go so overboard that it could cause damage to the skin underneath it, which then could introduce the chance for infection yeah. or other problems. Yeah. And again, we have a couple tricks. We have, again, a large immigrant population, especially Middle East. They use olive oil. And yeah. that's a trick I learned from a lot of families. And just a couple drops, rub it in, leave it overnight, and then um, brush it out in the morning. Um, so I've been recommending that to almost everybody. It, it works really nicely. Yeah. It just um, loosens up those yeah. dead mm-hmm. skin flakes yeah. so that they come off a little easier. And, and sometimes the the thick skin is there because you may have a little bit of, again, going back to our friend fungus, which grows in you know hot, moist areas. And you have a child who sweats a lot. And you may have a little bit of a fungal growth up there. So there's some... People have looked at Selsum Blue or one of the dandruff shampoo. So if for one that's not responding to the oil treatment, I'll ask the parents to just take a little bit of the shampoo, froth it up in like in a bowl, and then take those bubbles, put them on the cradle cap, let it sit there for like 30 seconds to a minute, um, then wash it off, you know, avoid the eyes. Um, you can put the oil on afterwards. 
that seems to kind of kill off some of that fungal overgrowth that may be keeping that plaque on there a little bit longer. Yeah. So, yeah. And like you said, watch the eyes because the, uh, so the uh, selenium sulfide, the yeah. active ingredient in like Salsa and Blue and yeah. other antifungal shampoos, um, is not no more tears. No, no. <laughs> There's lots more yeah. tears. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it's frustrating. I mean, we, we've seen yeah. kids yeah. with cradle cap, they'll have it for a better part of three, four months. And yeah. then parents get frustrated. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and then uh, atopic dermatitis is a fancy term for eczema. I think that's the common one that folks have, have heard of. Um, that's another really common uh, skin condition, not just in infants, but now really in kids and teenagers and adults. Uh, tell us about eczema. So eczema is, I guess, like a huge grab bag of any dry skin condition that just pops up and is chronic or happens more than just once or twice. And it can usually be in patches. It can be in certain areas of the body. Um, it can run in families. So there seems to be like a genetic sort of component to, to eczema. And kids that have allergies or asthma tend to be more prone to eczema because their immune system are, is a little more prone for these things. So eczema in and of itself is just a dry skin part. And there are various types of eczemas out there. There is infantile eczema, which tends to be face, um, trunk primarily, but it can also be on the back of the elbows compared to, let's say, toddler or adult eczema that's going to be more in, inside the elbows, the top of the knee, except compared to, say, behind the knee, um, and then can be like have big rough patches all over their lower legs and, and both of the you know back and, and the chest. Um, eczema is hard to treat if you just treat it once a day or only when it flares up. So the key to eczema is to kind of avoid it from flaring up. So if you have an infant who's prone to it and has had a couple weeks of dry skin, comes and goes, or they're just prone to the dry skin, first try to find a reason why. It could be a reaction to the detergent. I think we're talking about contact dermatitis next. So you're trying to avoid something that could be triggering the skin from having this sort of chronic um, dry skin condition. Um, make sure that you're not overbathing the child. Another trick is to double rinse your clothes so the detergent is completely washed off. Uh, you may have to go to cotton, more cotton-based clothes so it's a little less sort of allergic a little less irritating on the skin. So the first key is to try to find a reason for why the eczema occurred. And then this, the next is just to moisturize that area literally two, three, four times a day. And it can be Vaseline. It can be, you know, just any over-the-counter moisturizer. Um, we use a lot of Aquaphor and Dermaphor because that's what's covered around here. Um, but there is dozens of things out there. And some kids respond to some and some kids respond to others. I usually start off with just regular Vaseline because it's, it's inexpensive and easy to find. And just be aggressive with moisturizing. And then lastly, if it's not getting better, then let one of us take a look at it. And you may need a steroid, like, you know, a hydrocortisone, or like a cordaid, um, two to three times a day for like 10 days just to calm it down. The key is to keep it calm because the longer you allow the eczema to kind of stay there, um, the longer the eczema stays on there from, let's say, for several months, the more chance of you kind of having it long term. So the key is to kind of be aggressive up front. And most infant eczema is going to clear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the other thing I was going to add is um, sometimes they talk about eczema as the itch that rashes. So there, that's one of the other pieces. It's unlike some of these other things we've been talking about. It can be pretty miserable because it itches so much. And the babies can cry and they're trying to itch or scratch their arms or legs by rubbing them maybe against the... The mattress, the mattress cover, or whatever. So that's another part that can yeah, make it yeah. a hard thing to to live with over time. Yeah, it's a, and that's a good reason to keep your baby's uh, fingernails trimmed because it's so itchy, and then they're scratching, and then you can get little, um, you know, sort of micro tears in the skin, and then bacteria can get in, and then you can get a bacterial infection on top of the eczema. So if it's looking particularly bad and not going away, um, definitely you would want to let your doctor know. The other thing about young babies with eczema, um, that may make them at an increased risk for food allergies like uh, uh, peanut allergies. And so rather than, you know, we now recommend that you start introducing peanut products at an earlier age for kids as young as six months. But if they have uh, bad eczema, um, maybe they need to see an allergist first to determine if that's going to be a safe thing yeah. to do. Is that how you guys yeah, do it I, in your I, clinic? I agree. I agree. Yeah. And just to be cautious, if someone introduces peanut products around six months of age, that does not mean to give babies peanut butter. 
Yeah, or whole peanuts. Or or whole peanuts, (laughs) both of which can be choking hazards. One, the the peanut could get in their their windpipe, and the peanut butter can also get in And you must have had an eczema episode. Oh, yes. You you can literally spend an hour talking about various ways to treat this. Yeah. And peanut allergies yeah, yeah. <laughs> as well. No, but there are also, there are products that you can use um, to introduce right. peanuts uh, safely. And if you Google uh, Pediacast and peanut, uh, you'll find an episode that talks all about introducing uh, peanuts for babies. And, and then the last thing about eczema is avoid fragrant um, things. So again, baby skin or even toddler skin tends to be very sensitive. So try to keep to um, hy- hypoallergenic, um, non um, fragranted. Am I saying that right? Scent, Un- how about scent, scent free? free? There we yeah. go. Scent free. D- detergents. Um, yeah. And, and then um, try not to use a sort of, um, I haven't used in such a long time after the detergent you put in the fabric softener. The fabric softener. Yeah. There we go. It's like, you know, it's like, it sounds like. Um, so the, uh, avoid fabric softeners yeah. or and the dryer then, sheets. Yeah. Same and, thing. And then double rinse. And that's actually another trick that the dermatologist says, you know, to get some, all that detergent out of there. And when you're washing your baby, people always want to use the baby shampoo. A lot of baby shampoo has fragrance in it. So try to, to try to avoid and get a scent-free um, baby shampoo or, or baby. Yeah. Like, if it's a problem for yeah. your baby. If it's a problem, yeah. Same with soaps. I mean, you yeah. don't need all those extra things that are that make that make all those smells. Yeah. Because yeah. they can be, over time, especially they can be irritating. Yeah. Now, um, sometimes uh, kids will, well, this won't be a chronic problem that's going on for a long period of time. Or one that's, uh, you know, covering the whole body, but there may be times when it's just in a particular area. And uh, then we may call that contact dermatitis. Uh, Marianne, how is contact dermatitis different from eczema and uh, what causes it and what do we do for it? Yeah, I feel like I'm walking on a bridge here. Um, We started with eczema and then I think we're moving on to poison ivy and poison oak and sumac too. And in the middle of both of these is sort of like contact dermatitis, which is a great catch-all term, but rather technical too. So let's break it down. Contact means to come into contact with something, to touch something. So by definition, if we're talking about one of these type things, it means something has touched the skin and caused the skin to react with redness or itching or irritation. And just a little hint, if whenever you hear itis, whether it's rhinitis or dermatitis or folliculitis, that I-T-I-S means inflamed, meaning red, irritated, perhaps itching, maybe a little painful for whatever body part it's hooked onto in terms of the first part. And this one is hooked onto the word derm, which I said way in the beginning, uh, usually refers to our skin. So we're talking about things that touch the skin and make it feel not good. Um, so you can break that down into sort of irritant and allergic type contact dermatitis, and we've talked about several of those irritant ones. We've talked about diaper rash. Um, also, think about things like when uh, the winter time, when your hands get really dry or your lips get dry repeatedly, and that's often because or people are washing their hands constantly. There's this um, every time they get wet, that removes sort of the protective barrier over the lips or the skin. Or if people just feel like they need to bathe too much or wash their hands too much, all that removes the protective uh, barriers to the skin. So um, just like uh, uh, Alex described with the diaper, over time that really irritates the skin and causes that inflammation. So how do you manage that? You, You work to keep the skin moist. You do all those things to protect baby's bottoms. You can use the balm on the lips if you're older, uh, and you use a good moisturizer that doesn't have alcohol in it, um, um, watch out for lanolin because lanolin um, used to be, I think, in moisturizers more than it is now, uh, but that can also be irritating or cause an allergic type skin reaction. So keeping the skin moist and protected. So then allergic contact dermatitis this is different from the kind of allergies where you have trouble breathing and like to something uh, life-threatening. It's a different kind of an allergic reaction that basically happens <clears throat> when you come into contact with something that triggers special cells in your body to basically come to that site and produce chemicals and a skin reaction um, that says this is not a good thing for this particular body. And the common things that we think of are poison ivy, and we're going to talk about that in more detail in a minute or two. But another really common one is nickel, 
a lot of people have uh, allergic reactions to nickel, and you usually find that out by seeing like the back of a snap, maybe on infant or toddler pajamas, or on the inside of a you know pair of pants where the button or the buckle the snap is. Um, earrings can be a problem when you're when you're older. So nickel is a really common one. And then some of the antibiotics that we use on our skin or take neomycin is the most common one of those. Um, and you heard me mention lanolin. So with the co- contact dermatitis, um, there's similar things. First of all, try not to, once you, a lot of times you can kind of tell what caused it. So you can work to prevent um, coming into contact with it. You can do like a little barrier if you really got a favorite pair of jeans or whatever. To You don't want to not wear those, but you could protect against that a contact with metal. But then you want to settle down that irritation to the skin. And usually we use a, a steroid cream like um, Alex just mentioned. You can start out with mild ones and get stronger ones. Um, you also want to use like uh, keep it cool and... Um, and away from the other um, repeated contact. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and sometimes it gets really itchy. That was everything. So yeah, yeah. keep in mind that it, as well. Sometimes it can be really miserable for, and people have trouble sleeping. So there are ways to manage yeah. that as well. Yeah. Um, it, you'd mentioned poison ivy, and uh, that's the one that we mostly see here in Ohio. But in other parts of the country, there's also uh, poison oak and poison sumac um, that may be uh, more common than poison ivy in those places. Uh, but regardless of which one it is, this is kind of an extreme version of contact dermatitis. So, Alex, uh, t- talk to us about that poison ivy. So, first, poison ivy is the state plant of Ohio, just to let you know, because it's literally <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. And um, so, there are three plants and then we'll talk about you know, what oak and sumac look like um that produce a chemical called urushiol u r u s h i o l and it, it gives a local irritation of your skin so it gives a contact dermatitis there are some people that actually have a true true allergy to and we'll talk about that in a second that actually will have like a a problem breathing or swelling because of an exposure. Um, poison ivy is three-leaved. It's more of a sort of vine that grows on trees. It grows in the woods. It grows literally everywhere in Ohio. Um, and so the rule of thumb is if it's three leaves, three leaves, let it be. So leaves of three, let it be. Um, and it's very sort of irritating. It, it can be very irritating in the spring when all the urushiol toxin comes out into the first leaves. And also um, in the fall, we see a lot of it because people start burning their like leaves and um, some of the branches and there'll be poison ivy on it. And all of a sudden you're releasing the urushiol um, sort of oil into the air and you can actually get a, a reaction in, in the lungs. So I think most people know what poison ivy looks like. Poison oak is not really a tree. It's more of a bush. It goes around 20 to 30 feet tall. It also has three leaves. It looks like an oak leaf with three leaves. I have a cool picture here, which I guess you can put into the show notes. Um, and it, so it looks like poison ivy in a bush form, but again, it has more of an oak looking leaf. Not common in this area, but it is common throughout most of the United States. And then some called poison sumac, which has... Um, more like a spear-like appearing um, leaf structure. Again, 20 to 30 feet tall. I grew up in Pennsylvania where poison sumac actually is probably more common than poison ivy. Um, there are two types of sumac. One has red berries, and that one's okay. I wouldn't go recommending like rubbing yourself against it, but it's probably okay. And then the, this one actually has white berries. Um, but since they don't get berries until about midsummer, you know, please wait. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, when they gas on your skin, it actually gives you a local reaction and it once it's on the skin, it's not contagious. You can probably spread some of the oil, you know, by scratching at it. But it isn't like somebody's going to get, you know, a lot of people think it's going to be like crossing from person to person. You actually have to have contact with the oil. Um, a couple caveats here. The first is you can get a lot of it from pets. Um, we have a Labrador who loves to run through the woods and into bushes and chasing things. And I've gotten poison ivy three times by hugging her, and I got it along my arms and like upper chest by just hugging. Cordelia, um, because Cordelia loves poison ivy, or she likes to go in areas where poison ivy shows up. So if you have a pet that's outside a lot, then something to consider um, how you're going to get exposed to poison ivy. And you have to be really careful of burning things. So if you're going to like have a wood-burning stove, bonfire, just make sure that all that wood is clear of either ivy, um, sumac, or oak. Yeah. 
And I, I think regardless of um, the area of the country where you live, so you probably know, because you, you hear folks talk about it, uh, whether you mostly have poison ivy, poison oak, or poison sumac. So whatever one is most prevalent in your area, it's probably a good idea to Google it, look at pictures, show pictures with your kids. And when you're out and about, you know, like taking a walk in the park or even, you know, like you said, it's everywhere. So you may find a fence row that's got it growing up against it. But when you see it, kind of point that out to your kids, like, hey, this is what you're wanting to avoid. Yeah, And, and it's an oil. So we hike a lot. So my wife actually carries a, like a fat-based soap with us, like a not an alcohol-based, but it's a fat-based soap that you can squirt on your hands and kind of wash off an area because it kind of gets the oil off. Um, and they do sell a lot of these poison ivy soaps here in Ohio. Almost every gas station has it. Um, and it's sort of a quick way to kind of wash off the yeah. poison ivy because it takes like an hour or two for that rash to kind of start setting in for the irritation to occur. Yeah. But the sweatier and the hotter you are, the quicker that rash is going to kick in. Um, the key is to kind of wash it off if you've been exposed as quickly as possible. If you cannot wash it off, you start getting a reaction, be aggressive with it. You know, you can put on like a 1% hydrocortisone over the counter. Um, you can take some anti-itch medicine, anti-itch sort of creams. Um, but when in doubt, just call one of us. And sometimes you need to go for oral steroid pack. It's happened in our family, I think, four times where one of the kids or myself had to take oral steroids just because it got so bad. Yeah. And when it's on the face, you know, your eyelids yeah. can get really swollen. Or if it's down the groin area, yeah. it can, can yeah. swell. Um, or it may just be you have so much of it in so many different places that it's not practical to put cream everywhere. Yeah. Um, you'd be going through, you know, a tube a day. And so when that, you know, when that's the case, you want to be using something yeah. oral. And uh, this is, I mean, both of us do urgent care and ER. And this is one of the most common things we see in the dead of summer. Yeah, especially yeah. when soccer season kind of kicks in, and you know the kids are playing outside. Ball goes into the yeah. into the areas near the benches, and next thing you know, the kids have yeah. all over. Their and hands. that oil, once it's been on the skin a couple hours, it's it, you can't really wash it off at that point, right? I mean, it, it's almost yeah. like a permanent, and that's why the, the rash lasts so long because you need to slough off the old skin and make new skin before, yeah. um, but you know, before it gets better. Uh, and when you do wash it off, don't get in a bath. Don't don't take a bath. Yeah, because it'll spread all over. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's, I, I didn't think about that. That's a really good. That's a really good point. Yeah. So. Couple yeah. other things too. Um, when you like, I think those soaps you talked about are really good when you know you've been exposed. But yeah. sometimes you don't until the next day. You're like, oh, this is not a good sign. And by then, the your clothes have been in the laundry or whatever. And I know at least a couple of times when we've had that in our household where. You did the laundry and you got it, you know, suddenly you've got this rash over your arms and you weren't even the one that was out um, walking or playing in the woods or whatever. So the oil can persist just like it can on the pets, um, on like your clothing if you've been running through the woods. Um, and the itching, uh, that's another reason sometimes the oral steroids, if you're just covered with that, it makes it really hard to yeah. sleep. Mm. And we know that that's. Um, important so the oral steroids can help yeah. suppress yeah. those symptoms in the in the uh, uh anti-itch medicines um like cetirizine and loratadine and mm -hmm. zyrtec claritin those kind of things yeah um can also help control the itch and then one, one more caveat don't go hiking in open-toed sandals or flip-flops because you can actually get it on your feet and it's a it's a bear speaking from experience when you get it down your feet because between I your mean, toes yeah and, and I mean you, it's it's literally hard to work because now all of a sudden you go into work with just like yeah. completely itchy yeah. foot and it's I know this is like a gross image um, but it, th that's almost an, always an oral pack of steroids just because you're like I I can't take this so yeah yeah because it's a very intense itch yeah. it's not yeah. yeah and one other uh, tip um, just because. Say you're in the middle of winter and you know it's poison ivy, and, but it's brown and dead and dormant. That doesn't change the oil. The oil is still there, and doesn't matter if the plant's alive, the or living or active, the oils are still there. Yeah. So don't think you can even like gardening gloves and gardening equipment. Mm -hmm. You get them out for the first time in the spring, and they maybe have the oil on them too. Exactly. Yeah, I, uh, I saw a kid many many years ago who was uh, hiking in the woods and had to go to the bathroom and he picked plant leaves to use as toilet paper. And of course it was poison ivy, had a horrible, terrible rash. And I asked him if he learned anything about from this experience. And he said, yeah, I learned that I should pack toilet paper in my backpack. <laughs> that wasn't the lesson we were looking for. <laughs> he, he was getting there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Uh, the next one on my list is insect bites and stings. And uh, Marianne, you're going to tell us about those. 
Well, there's an awful lot of bugs, a lot of insects. Um, so we could, I'm sure you may have had an episode just on this, uh, but if not, maybe you will. Um, it's kind of interesting when you actually think bites and stings. Okay, well, what's the difference? So the bites are when the insect uses its mouth parts the way it uses them to eat or to attack something, um, and it uses it, their mouth as more of a weapon and punctures the skin and may have some salivary um, juices that they might be using. So a bite is more of a puncture or a, literally like a bite, whereas a sting is when uh, the the insect with the stinger actually injects venom, and that's a different, little bit of a different kettle of fish because the venom is what could cause the problem. So uh, bites, you know, depending on how big or what the, in, the insect is, you may not even know you had it. Maybe it looked like a little red spot or whatever, but it can be painful. Um, it can you can have multiple bites, but usually not a whole ton of them. Um, and really, it's a matter of letting it kind of get better on its own. It, if it's very painful, you can take some over-the-counter ibuprofen or acetaminophen for the pain. It's always good to wash anything that breaks the skin at that site to get rid of the potential for infection with um, bacteria entering the skin through that open wound, even though it's very small. Um, so keep it clean, keep an eye on it, um, manage the pain if it's a, if an issue, and it will us- a bite will usually kind of fade away. And then stings, again, depending on sort of the circumstances, if it was sort of like a one-off or versus you accidentally swatted a beehive, um, the number of stings um, and what they were, um, what whether you have any sensitivity to, say, bee stings, which is another discussion, um, bee sting allergies, that can cause, again, local a local reaction that's just red and painful, um, a more large local reaction where maybe your whole arm gets red and swollen and painful, or you can have a, a systemic um, allergic reaction where you really need to be treated um, with epinephrine. Um, if you know you're allergic to bee stings, then you need to um, have your EpiPen right there. Yeah. When you yep. say systemic, whole body. Whole body. Thank yep. you. I was in my head. I was like, what is that word? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I was trying to say, that's it's an emergency, right? Um, whole body, because you're having trouble breathing, you're having trouble, your blood pressure is dropping, you're feeling faint, your heart's racing, and you could collapse and it could uh you could die. So. Yeah. And that's what we'd call that anaphylaxis. That's, if you've heard that word before, that's a very severe yeah. life-threatening allergic reaction. And uh, it's better to use your, if you have an EpiPen, don't be afraid to use it or an epinephrine auto injector. Um, EpiPen's a brand name. There are other brands as well. Um, but don't be afraid to use that and then call 911 um, and then uh, go from there. And, but, just, and take it with you. Don't think you're, you don't really need it. You need to have it. And if, when we see someone who, for the first time, may have had a reaction to a bee sting, um, we always have them evaluated because that's one kind of allergy, A, that may be able to be treated, and B, it's critical that they uh, get that EpiPen. If yeah. I can just add a couple mm-hmm. a couple caveats. Yeah. So mm-hmm. the EpiPen's job is to not stop the allergic reaction. It's really to open up the airway and to get better blood flow. Um, so you still need to get seen. So if you use oh, your yeah, EpiPen, yeah. you still need to get seen. Because a lot of I've had a patient who came to urgent care like five hours later. They're like, I gave, I gave the EpiPen on the soccer field, and now all of a sudden they're not doing well. And you still have to get something to stop the reaction. So EpiPen is there to kind of save your life, and then you need some additional treatment for for that anaphylactic reaction. Yeah. Um. The second is if you happen to stumble on, especially wasp nests, or like you know that live in the ground. Um and you get bitten by multiple, and you don't know if it's a reaction or you have so much venom in you that you feel like you're having a reaction, it's okay to give an EpiPen, but get, seek help because there are ways to kind of slow down the reaction. So sometimes you get so many injections. That, again, we've seen this in the ER in urgent care where a child has so many injections of you know playing Whatever soccer that venom yeah, is, yeah. and you know get seen. And then ants can give a lot of venom. And also we don't have a lot of it here, but you know for the, our folks listening in the Southeast um, states, I mean, fire ants can give as bad a reaction as wasps. Yeah. Um, so that's something to consider. I know you go down to Florida a lot yeah. and live down there. And then the last thing is some kids will get a mosquito bite, so not a venom, and they'll have these huge welts. It's not really a reaction or an allergy, but some kids are just more prone to whatever's coming out, saliva, whatever, out of the mosquito. 
And those are kids that you may need to start like hydrocortisone cream on them. Um, and we have one child in the clinic who, you know, he, no skin conditions at all, plays a lot of sports and he walks around, looks like he had welts all over his body because he's so like prone to swelling and he'll eventually outgrow it. Um, but it's some, for some kids, it's like, you know, they don't want to go outside because of this. So be aggressive. Like, yeah. If your child's going to get big welts, just as soon as you see a mosquito bite, just put some hydrocortisone on it. Yeah. yeah, and for whatever reason, some people are much more attractive to mosquitoes, yeah. whether it's the, uh, the smell of their body or the amount of carbon dioxide that is, their inhale, or is a part of their respiratory um, air. air it, we don't really know. But as one of those people, I, it's like I always have to stay. So we haven't talked about prevention yet. So preventing exposure. So keep your skin covered. If, uh, don't go out at dawn and dusk for mosquitoes. Keep your eyes vigilant so you don't cross those uh, nests, et cetera. Um, and then um, use window screens, things like that, and, uh, for those uh, to keep out the mosquitoes at night. And then we talked about DEET, which is the insect repellent. Um, that really, if you're going to go out in the woods or hiking or going to be in an area where there's going to be a lot of bugs, even if maybe you're playing soccer and there's bunch of high grass right around nearby you want to have that protection yeah and when you're in that high grass or you're in the woods uh tick bites are uh, definitely one possibility um i wanted to talk about them separately because a lot of times when you get a tick bite you, you find the tick on your skin mm -hmm. and so uh parents you know wonder how what's the best way to get the tick out and then do you yeah. need to be seen yeah so so ticks bite so as to have babies so it's female ticks that will bite and there are various ticks out there but it's usually during brood season where they're producing the babies at least in the midwest it tends to be sort of april may and then in the early fall um, other parts of the country may have three seasons of them producing you know eggs and, and young um the tick bites can vary so there are a bunch of different tick bites some called a dog tick which tends to be bigger um and that can actually you can see like this big gross thing kind of attached to you and then some called deer ticks which is can give you other infections like Lyme disease, um, which tend to hide in like more like folded skin and they tend to be very small. Um, so rule of thumb is if you're going hiking somewhere, if you're going outside, if you're playing soccer, go for a walk, just do a tick check when you get back home. Um, if you have a pet, they will attract every tick in town. Um, so just make sure that when they come home, just do a tick check as well. Um, ticks can give infections. The, actually, the most common infection after a tick bite is just a local skin infection. So dog ticks, people say oh, it's not a big deal. It's not going to give me Lyme disease, but it can give you other sort of not as well-known infections as Lyme disease, but it can also give you a local skin infection. So rule of thumb number one is try to wear clothes where the ticks can't get into you. If you go outside and let's say it's a nice day, you have a t-shirt and shorts on, um, just do a tick check. And we actually do it almost every time we come home from like a long hike, we'll, we'll like check each other um, for places, you know, that you may not even expect to see a tick. Uh, we were in, a, in Connecticut for a music camp, not far from Lyme, and um, which is where Lyme disease got first described. And sure enough, I ended up having two tick bikes from hiking in the woods with my wife and so I was like, ooh, what happens now? But, you know, I, I just had a pipe for like one day. But, you know, it's one of those scary things like, oh, my gosh, you know, I'm going to be having Lyme disease. Um, and then how do you get rid of ticks? You have to gently remove them. So don't burn them off. Um, don't have grandpa put a cigarette on them. Don't have somebody pour oil on it. Um, don't use a credit card to kind of like flick them off. You almost have to get in there with like a good pair of tweezers, get in almost below the skin to kind of get those grasps that the ticks have, like the big graspers and grab underneath the skin and then pull it out in one forceful jerk. Yeah. If you hike a lot, they do have tick removal tools mm -hmm. that you can uh, pack with you. It's just a real thin piece of uh, V-shaped uh, metal yeah. that you can kind of slide between the skin and the tick and then gently pull up. Yeah, and, and, the, and most camping stores sell them. And we live in, in a more like little east of here in a more rural area. You can, uh, most every store has those around just because yeah. people hike a lot. Yeah, and the black-legged tick or deer tick um, they are, uh, the population of them have been moving West. And so we do see more Lyme disease in Ohio than we did 20 years ago. It was almost unheard of until we've been here 18 years. So 18 years ago, it was like almost unheard of. Now we're seeing, I mean, it's, it's, we have to think about it when a child comes into clinic or urgent care. It's like, yeah. this can easily be Lyme disease. Yeah. So, so we're definitely seeing that yeah. tick population moving, yeah. moving this way. And we see Rocky Mountain spotted fever here, even though 
we aren't near the Rocky Mountains. Which it's is actually most common in Appalachian. Right. Yeah. 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 Another tick-borne. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, all right. Uh, and then, of course, once you get the tick out, you know, wash that area with soap and water real yeah. well and maybe even put an antibiotic ointment on and, and top. If, and if you see like a bullseye rash, then get seen by one of us because then you're worried about an infection brewing, especially Lyme disease. Yeah. And then you can like start start therapy quickly. Yeah. Uh, but if you don't have any rash or symptoms after the tick, you don't have to be seen by someone unless you there's problems. Yeah. And in years past, I, I trained in for infectious diseases. I trained in D.C. We actually had a lab that you can bring a tick in to see if they had Lyme because it was like a big NIH study. But we've had people come to our clinic with a tick in a, in a jar and we can't test for that anymore. So... Just crush the tick. And, yeah. yeah. But it's good to keep, uh, to kind of take, take a, a picture, picture of it yeah. now because if you do develop symptoms a week or so later, um, it may be helpful to know what kind of a tick. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. To take, yeah. And take put something next to it, like a penny yeah. or something, you know, yeah. just so you can get size. relative size. Yeah. 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 Uh, all right, let's move on uh, to sunburn. Um, as we're here at the beginning of, uh, of spring and we have summer ahead of us, uh, remind us about sun safety, Marianne. Yeah, so all these wonderful, I mean, we're talking about all these bad things which are associated with being outside. And um, being outside is great because it's good for your mental health, it's good for your physical health. So what the bottom line is, I said, I would say is be careful and be take preventive measures, but enjoy the great outdoors. But one of the things is if you enjoy the great outdoors with um, out pr sun protection, especially during the middle parts of the day when the sun is most um, high in the sky, you are susceptible to getting sunburn. And sunburn is literally a burn to your skin, damage to your skin, um, and it runs the range from a mild redness and irritation and kind of burning. A more serious kind is like almost like a secondary burn where you may even blister, and that really is a deeper damage to the skin. So it's uncomfortable um, and it's not good for your skin over time. It can lead to aging of the skin and wrinkles, uh, which may or may not matter to you. It certainly doesn't worry kids when they're five or 10 years old or even 15 or 20 probably. And then also it does increase your risk for getting uh, skin cancer, including melanoma, which is one of the most uh, dangerous types of cancer and skin cancer. So like many of these things we've talked about, Prevention is very possible and um, important. Trying to avoid the midday sun, um, to wear longer sleeves or light cover, light clothes to reflect the sun, big brimmed hats, sunglasses, that also protects your eyes from the sun uh, to keep you from developing maybe cataracts down the road. Um, and then using sunscreen with SPF at least 30 um, and you can use that safely down to about six months old. Uh, little babies, you should just keep out of the sun. Um, and one other thing is if you're doing sunscreen and, um, and DEET or insect repellent, I think the guidelines are put the sunscreen on first to let it protect the skin and then add the insect repellent on top. And depending on which product you have depends on how often you have to reapply um, usually within four to six hours, depending on how much swimming or water you've been doing or how long you've been out in the fields or in the sun. Yeah. If you do get burnt, oh, figure yeah. out how long that was <laughs> and, and do it quicker, sooner next time, right? Or just do it before, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just and then, frequent frequent again, reapplication of the sunscreen, but uh, not the DEET. The DEET you just yes. usually use once. Yeah, I'm sorry. Day. Yeah. Um, and then like all the other things we've been talking about, Sometimes, uh, if it's really painful, you can take an over-the-counter pain medicine. Make sure the skin stays clean. Um, a, sometimes, cool little soaks or cool cloth will help relieve that discomfort as well. And just, just two caveats here, people like, why do I burn more at the beach? Is because the sand will like bounce the, um, the, the sunlight back and the water. And the water. Um, so you'll see more burns. And be especially careful if you're at the beach if you go swimming because now all of a sudden you have like a a double risk, almost like a double risk. And then try to avoid tanning oils. They seem to be a popular thing because they smell nice and you kind of put on, you know, you look at the picture and the teen's thinking, well, I'm going to be looking like that. And they just burn your skin. It just so, we see that so often. It's like a magnifying glass on, is, your, you know, on your skin. <laughs> so they're going to go to the beach, put on tanning oil as like, you might as well be a piece of bacon in a frying pan. Yeah, and yeah. Like, you know, just, you know, just try to avoid the temptation. Yeah. And, so. and you can get sunburnt on a cloudy day. 
that's another important point. Those yeah. ultraviolet rays c- come through the clouds. So just because it's a cloudy day, you should still wear the sunscreen. Yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, so we, we're running short on time. We have two more uh, topics to cover, and uh, they are related in that they um, are caused by viruses. So these are virus infections of the skin. Um, the first one, uh, molluscum contagiosum. And unfortunately, I don't really have... That's the name for it. I don't think that there's a more common name. No, is they're, there? they're like little warts that have like a, I'm going to call, I'm, I'm not sure if people remember the Pillsbury Doughboy. Somebody like <laughs> pushed them in the middle and they kind of like giggled and they had like this little hole in the middle. So it looks almost like a donut. It's like a wart that looks like a donut hole in the middle. Um, they're very common in kids. They tend to be smaller than like the worst that Marianne's going to talk about. They can be almost anywhere in the body, and they are contagious. So if you have one, you can easily scratch and spread it to other parts of your body. The rule of thumb of molluscum is that it will clear with time. Um, it can take up to nine months to a year to clear. So if you want to get rid of it sooner, um, you can – we actually tried I, – I had a patient with this a couple of days ago from the residence. We tried Retin-A. Um, which is a retinoic acid because it kind of irritates the skin a little bit. So now the body realizes there's something there and helps clear it out. If they're really bad, really embarrassing, if you're a wrestler, for example, or a swimmer where you, you're not allowed to swim if you have some of these, um, you may, ha- may have to go to derm to kind of have some called cryotherapy where they actually freeze these things off. Um, but the rule of thumb is, again, they'll get better on their own. It's more common, smaller kids. Um, talk to one of us. I mean, we try retin for the first time that I haven't in a while. Um, and we'll see what the response is. But I tried in the past and it seemed to work pretty well. Yeah. So these are flesh colored like a dome and with they, a little umbe- with a yeah. little dent in the middle. Yeah, of it looks it. literally like a like a donut sticking out yeah. of you with a little hole in the middle. So and sometimes yeah. it takes a while to see the little hole, but if, if you have good eyes and you can usually see it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, compare that to regular warts. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Marion. So you heard me kind of say molluscum is they're usually pretty small, like um I was going to maybe about three to five millimeters. Five millimeters seems to me like that would be pretty big. Um, but warts are usually bigger, although you can have little ones scattered around it too. So warts are also caused by viruses. Um, common places are on the hands, sometimes on the bottom of the feet. Um, and uh, like, and they're bigger, they're more, sometimes almost look a little bit like cauliflowery. I think it might be an example. Um, they can cause people to be self-conscious, especially the bigger ones on their hands, uh, so people don't like to have them. Um, and But like the others, uh, they will eventually often go away on their own, but that can be sped up um, with different kinds of treatment. And some of that little irritation, just to kind of keep working it away, um, helps. And that was sort of the duct tape, I think, phenomenon, which... There's some evidence that maybe it actually yeah. works. So if people want to give it a shot at home and it's you've got a good, you know, kind of single one or two larger warts, um, this, the traditional duct tape, the silvery kind, seems to work better because it has a different kind of adhesive. It sticks on better and it's a little bit more irritating. And you can cut a little piece of that and change it. Several times a week. It's the, the MacGyver way of practicing <laughs> pediatrics. Yeah, yeah. But it works. <laughs> it does work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and if you don't want to, and, and also doing it yourself, you can get over-the-counter um, salicylic acid, which has some aspirin in it as well as sulfur. Um, and that can be applied frequently and kind of scrape it off a little bit before you put that on. Um, we can do that also in the, in the clinic system. Um, and then there's also freezing it, the cryotherapy that... Um, Alex mentioned, or liquid nitrogen, dry ice, that kind of thing, which can be applied as well. But none of these uh, does the job overnight. It, none of them is a single treatment, unless it's just a really teeny tiny wart, which you might not even know you have. Yeah. So kind of count on it, even with an effective treatment that's working well, it's going to be several weeks. Yeah. And the virus that's uh, that causes warts is the human papillomavirus, and, uh, or HPV. And so folks may have heard of this in terms of its association with cervical cancer, some specific strains of papil- uh, human papillomavirus. So I just want to put a plug in that uh, HPV infections that can lead to cervical cancer uh, are preventable with the HPV vaccine that we would highly recommend. 
Um, you know, there are some teenagers who uh, hyperventilate and feel a little lightheaded and pass out after they get an immunization, but that doesn't mean that the immunization did something damaging to their brain. So sometimes that happens. You've probably seen that in, in clinic too. But, yeah. you know, folks, what's one of the things on the internet you'll find it causes brain damage and we, there's no evidence of that whatsoever. Yes. And, and two carries about warts, you do not get them from frogs. You can get warts from literally <laughs> or, toads. Any, or toads. Yeah, there we go. Um, and, uh, but they are contagious. In other words, right. and, yeah. and that's, for example, um, wrestlers with warts aren't, aren't allowed to wrestle or they have to have it covered Co- up. Yeah. Um, and the second thing is tell parents that there is some data for the duct tape. I remember um, a parent was quite upset with us in clinic because they waited like an hour and a half for us to see him. It was a really busy day. And he's like, I was here an hour and a half for you to tell me to put duct tape on my child's finger. And, um, but it's like, there, there are some studies out yeah. there that have looked at it and yeah. we do it all the time. Do a little salicylic acid, a drop at night, cover it up. And it seems to work. So why, yeah. why do something more aggressive when you can just go yeah. to. Well, and those wart pads, I think, have a similar adhesive mm-hmm. in yeah. them. Yeah. That it also ha- is medicated, but the the adhesive does help, you know, it just help it works it better. T- it tells the body yeah. there's something there, and then the body gets rid of it. Yeah. And that, that's really the theory behind it. So. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, uh, this has been a fantastic uh, discussion on skin. Um, as I mentioned in August, we're going to have part two. And uh, we have just as many things to cover then. Things like uh, impetigo, cellulitis, abscesses, ingrown toenails. Uh, lice, scabies, ringworm, you know, just there's a lot of things that, that all this uh, fun stuff. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. So yeah. we're going to, we'll cover those items uh, next time. Uh, before we go, Alex, remind us about uh, primary care pediatrics at Nationwide Children's. I mean, you guys are like everywhere. Yeah, so we're a large system. We have 14, soon to be 15 located areas. In other words, like a true, true clinic, which covers around 140, 160,000 unique patients. And so we have, upwards of over a quarter million visits um, per year for those patients. And we also have now 14 school-based clinics. Just got that data yesterday from one of our colleagues. And we have two mobile vans that kind of go around the area. So that's going to even expand further the number of of children that we serve. Um, It's a nice system. We have a lot of teaching. So we have six resident clinics, um, one of the six being a MedPeds clinic. We have four clinics that actually work with family medicine residents as well or nurse practitioner students. So um, it's it's a lot of teaching in these clinics, and I think when you go to a clinic with with trainees, you, you get very good care, just because they're they're interested, they want to learn, and, and they get a lot of one on one attention from from the trainees. And then the non training clinics tend to have very good physicians. Um, so we're busy. We have evening hours. We have Saturday hours. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're a busy lot. Yeah, absolutely. So. And I'll put a link in the show notes to Primary Care Pediatrics yeah. at Nationwide Children so folks can uh, find it easier. Um, we'll also put a fo- – there's a phone number if you're in Central Ohio and you want to get linked up with a clinic, uh, 614-722-KIDS, 614-722-KIDS. And uh, that's our physician referral line. And they'll, they'll uh, fix you up with a primary care clinic in your neighborhood because they're all over the place here in Central Ohio. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, once again, uh, Dr. Marianne Abrams and Dr. Alex Rakowski with Primary Care Pediatrics at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Uh, Thank you both so much for stopping by. Sure. Thank you. Great to be here. Bye-bye. back with just enough time to say thanks to all of you for taking time out of your day and making PediaCast a part of it. I really do appreciate that. Also, thanks to our guests this week, Dr. Marianne Abrams and Dr. Alex Rakowski, both with Primary Care Pediatrics at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Don't forget, you can find us wherever podcasts are found in the Apple and Google podcast apps, iHeartRadio, Spotify, SoundCloud, Amazon Music, and most other podcast apps for iOS and Android, including that new one, Good Pods. So be sure to check us out there. Uh, Our landing site is pediacast.org. You'll find our entire archive of past programs there, along with our show notes, our terms of use agreement, and that handy contact page if you would like to suggest a future topic for the program. Reviews are helpful wherever you get your podcasts. We always appreciate when you share your thoughts about the show, and we love connecting with you on social media. You'll find us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Simply search for PediaCast. Also, don't forget about our sibling podcast, PediaCast CME. 
That stands for Continuing Medical Education. It's similar to this program. We turn the science up a couple notches. We don't always use plain language. And we offer free continuing medical education credit for those who listen. Of course, that includes doctors, but also nurse practitioners, physician assistants, nurses, pharmacists, psychologists, social workers, and dentists. And since Nationwide Children's is jointly accredited by many professional organizations, it's likely we offer the exact credits you need to fulfill your state's continuing medical education requirements. Of course, you want to be sure the content of the episode episode matches your scope of practice. Shows and details are available at the landing site for that program, pediacastcme.org. You can also listen wherever podcasts are found. Simply search for pediacastcme. Thanks again for stopping by. And until next time, this is Dr. Mike saying stay safe, stay healthy, and stay involved with your kids. So long, everybody. This program is a production of Nationwide Children's. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on PediaCast.